Right, we're going to just watch initially a little um, free clip from Bible Project on Kings. That's where we're operating, so we're just going to see that for just a few minutes, and, um, and then I'll continue on. Thanks, uh, Josh. Thank you. They were originally written as one book telling a unified story that continues on from the book of Samuel that came before it. So David has unified the tribes of Israel into a kingdom, and God promised that from his line would come a messianic king who would establish God's kingdom over the nations and fulfill the promises made to Abraham. So the book of Kings tells the story of the long line of kings that came after David, and none of them lived up to that promise. In fact, they run the nation of Israel right into the ground. The book is designed to have five main movements. The story begins and ends focus on Jerusalem, first with Solomon's reign and the construction of the temple, and then in this last section ending with Jerusalem's destruction and Israel's exile to Babylon. And the story leading up to this tragedy is what makes up the center three sections, which explain how Israel split into two rival kingdoms, how God tried to prevent the corruption of Israel by sending the prophets, and how exile became the unavoidable consequence of Israel's sin. The book opens with two chapters about the kingdom passing from the aging David to his son Solomon. And David's final words to Solomon, they're very similar to those of Moses and Joshua and Samuel to the people. It's a call to remain faithful to the commands of the covenant and to give allegiance to the God of Israel alone. But David's words ring somewhat hollow here because David and Solomon then go on to conspire how they're going to consolidate this new kingdom through a whole series of political assassinations. It's not off to a great start. Solomon's brightest moment comes when he asks God for wisdom to lead Israel. And he even completes David's dream to make a temple for the God of Israel. Here the story actually stops and describes the design of this temple in detail, just like the tabernacle design in the Torah. There's all these gold and jewels and depictions of angels and fruit trees. It's all symbolism echoing back to the Garden of Eden. It's the place where heaven and earth meet, where God's presence dwells with his people. But no sooner does Solomon finish the temple that he makes some really horrible choices and the kingdom falls apart. He starts marrying the daughters of other kings, hundreds of them, for political alliances. And then he adopts their gods and introduces the worship of those gods into Israel. Solomon then accumulates huge amounts of wealth. He builds a huge army. He even institutes slave labor for all of his building projects. Now, if you go back to the Torah and look at God's guidelines for Israel's kings in Deuteronomy 17, Solomon is breaking every one. So by the time that he dies, Solomon resembles Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, more than he does his father David. The next section of the book opens with Solomon's son, Rehoboam, acting just like his father. It's a very sad story of greed and lust for power. He tries to increase taxes for slave labor. And under the leadership of Jeroboam, the northern tribes reject this. They rebel and secede and form their own rival kingdom. And so now in the story, you have the southern kingdom, Judah, centered in Jerusalem with kings from the line of David. And now this new northern kingdom called Israel, whose capital will be Samaria eventually. Jeroboam also goes on to build two new temples to compete with Solomon's temple in the south. He puts a golden calf in each one to represent the God of Israel. The connection to Exodus 32 and the golden calf, it's all quite explicit. From this point on, the story goes back and forth from north to south, tracing the fate of both kingdoms. Each one had about 20 successive kings, and as the author introduces each king, he evaluates their reign by a few criteria. Did they worship the God of Israel alone, or did they promote the worship of other gods? Did they deal with idolatry among the people? And did they remain faithful to the covenant like David, or do they become corrupt and unjust? And according to these criteria, the author finds no good kings in northern Israel, zero for 20. And then in southern Judah, only eight out of 20 get a positive rating, which connects to another huge purpose in this book. And that's to introduce the role of the prophets, key figures in Israel's history. So in the Bible, prophets were not fortune tellers. Rather, they spoke on behalf of the God of Israel, and they played the role of covenant watchdogs, which means they called out idolatry and injustice among the kings and the people. They were constantly reminding Israel of their calling to be a light to the nations, that they should obey the commands of the Torah, and so the prophets challenged Israel to repent and follow their God. In these center sections for each king, God then raises up prophets to hold them accountable. 
And the most prominent prophets are the northern ones, Elijah and his disciple Elisha, right here in the center of the book. Elisha was a wild man of a prophet living out in the desert, and his arch nemesis was the northern king Ahab and his Canaanite wife Jezebel. Together, these two had instituted the worship of the Canaanite god Baal over Israel. And so in a famous story, Elijah challenged 450 prophets of Baal to a contest to see which god was real. So they both build altars and pray to their gods, but only the god of Israel answers with fire. After this, Ahab uses his royal power to murder an Israelite farmer and then steal his family's vineyard. And Elijah again confronts Ahab's injustice and he announces the downfall of his house. Elijah eventually passes the mantle of his prophetic leadership to a young disciple named Elisha, who asks for two times the authority of Elijah. And what's fascinating here is how the author, he's recounted seven miraculous feats for Elijah, and then he offers stories of 14 acts of power from Elisha. Both prophets were clearly remarkable men, and they played the same role, confronting Israel's kings for idolatry and injustice. And ultimately, they were unsuccessful in turning Israel back from apostasy. In the next section, the northern kingdom is rocked by a bloody revolution started by a king named Jehu, who destroys Ahab's family. And although Jehu was at first commissioned by God, his violence just gets out of control, and it creates the spiral of political assassinations and rebellions from which Israel never recovered. Coup follows coup after Jehu, and each king follows other gods, allows horrible injustice. It all leads up to 2 Kings chapter 17. The big bad empire of Assyria swoops down and takes out the northern kingdom altogether. In the capital city of Samaria, it's conquered, and the Israelites are exiled and scattered throughout the ancient world. Now, chapter 17 is key. The author stops the story and offers this prophetic reflection on what's just happened. He blames the downfall of the northern kingdom on the idolatry and covenant unfaithfulness of Israel and its kings. And so God has allowed them to face the consequences of their decisions. The final movement of the book tells the story of the lone southern kingdom. And here we meet some very heroic kings like Hezekiah, who trusts God when the armies of Assyria come knocking on Jerusalem's door. Or Josiah, who discovers this lost scroll of the Torah in the temple. So he starts reading it. He's convicted and he institutes religious reforms to remove idolatry and Canaanite influences from the land. But... Judah is just too far gone. The king, right in between these two, Manasseh, he's the worst by far. So he not only introduces the worship of idol statues into the Jerusalem temple, he also institutes child sacrifice. And so God sends prophets to say, the time is up. Israel has reached the point of no return. The final chapters tell the story of the Babylonian empire coming to invade Jerusalem, destroy the temple, and carry the people and the royal line of David off into exile. And so the story ends leaving us wondering, is God done with Israel? Is he done with the line of David? Well, the final paragraph zooms about 40 years forward into the exile, and it tells a very odd story. It's about Jehoiakim, a descendant from David, who would have been king if he was back in Jerusalem. And the king of Babylon releases him from prison and invites him to eat at the royal table for the rest of his life, and the book ends. So it's not much, but it's a story that gives a glimmer of hope that God has not abandoned the line of David. So the question now is, how is God going to fulfill his promises to Abraham, to David? How is he going to bless the nations and bring the messianic kingdom? And to answer those questions, you have to read on into the wisdom and the prophetic books. But for now, that's the book of Kings. Hope you enjoyed that um, that overview of the Book of Kings, and um, it's a a real good read when you you know start reading through, and um, just getting the big picture, and uh, being encouraged by the the stories that happen, and uh, being discouraged also by the stories that happen. Uh, in the book of Kings and Chronicles. Just trying to get the little machine turned on here. It's on. It's on. It's on. Let me see. I didn't 
feel it vibrate in my hand. There we go. Okay, thank you. All right, looks like we're good to go. We're just going to pause for prayer and just ask the Lord to encourage us as we look at his word today. Heavenly Father, thank you again today for the opportunity to look at your word and uh, we would ask that you would challenge us and encourage us as we look at the, uh, the kings uh, before us today and we would ask this in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. So today we're in... Um, if you're, if you're reading in your Bibles, if you've done any pre-reading, we're in 2 Kings chapter 8 and 9 and 2 Chronicles 21, 22 and 23. And um, <clears throat> the, the kings that we're looking at today and queen um, are Jehoram, Ahaziah and Athaliah. And um, they're in, um, in those portions of scripture there. So it's um, two kings one queen and they're all bad they're all bad there's no good kind of happening anywhere here today in in that sense and um i'm sure that's why nobody wanted to pick these this passage of scripture to speak on okay because um so so it ended up with me but that's that's fine nothing there's there's nothing good happening here and um so i'm going to read to you in two chronicles so if you have your bible with you uh, <clears throat> turn to 2 Chronicles and we're going to read uh, in chapter 21 and uh, just read a little bit about Jehoram and, um, and see what happens there. Now, Jehoram's father was Jehoshaphat and uh, so in chapter 21, then Jehoshaphat rested with his ancestors and was buried with them in the city of David. And Jehoram, his son, succeeded him as king. Jehoram's brothers, the sons of Jehoshaphat, were Azariah, Jehiel, Zechariah, Azahu, Michael, and Shephaiah. All these were sons of Jehoshaphat, king of Israel. Now, their father had given them many gifts of silver and gold and articles of value, as well as fortified cities in Judah. But he had given the kingdom to Jehoram because he was his firstborn son. When Joram established himself firmly over his father's kingdom, he put all his brothers to the sword along with some of the officials of Israel. Jehoram was 32 years old when he became king and he reigned in Jerusalem eight years. He followed the ways of the kings of Israel as the house of Ahab had done, for he married a daughter of Ahab. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Nevertheless, because of the covenant of the Lord, had made with David, the Lord was not willing to destroy the house of David. He had promised to maintain a lamp for him and his descendants forever. And so, <coughs> he's a piece of work, this fellow Jehoram. And um, as a result of that, God deals with him. And um, in verse 12, it says, Jehoram received a letter from Elijah the prophet, which said, this is what the Lord, the God of your father David says. You have not followed the ways of your father Jehoshaphat or of Asa, king of Judah, but you've followed the ways of the kings of Israel and you have led Judah and the people of Jerusalem to prostitute themselves just as the house of Ahab did. You have also murdered your own brothers, members of your own family, men who are better than you. So now the Lord is about to strike your people, your sons, your wives and everything that is yours with a heavy blow. And you yourself will be very ill with a lingering disease of the bowels until the disease causes your bowels to come out. Wow, imagine getting a letter like that. Not very exciting. And um, I'm sure Jehoram kind of thought, where's that bloke, um, Elijah? If he comes anywhere near me, I'm going to stick a, a sword in him. But, um, but that's, that's what happened and... In verse number 20, Jehoram was 32 years old when he became king and he reigned in Jerusalem eight years. He passed away to no one's regret and was buried in the city of David, but not in the tombs of the king. And so 32 when he became king, he was king for eight years. His dad was Jehoshaphat. 
Okay, so if you could have a quick look up there. Um, this thing's got a pointer in it somewhere, I think. Bring it up. Okay, you can see Jeho um, Jehoshaphat, and then his son is Jehoram. He's married to Athaliah, okay, who is the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel, right? And then um, the next fellow we were going to look at after Jehoram is Ahaziah, and, and then we're looking at Athaliah as well. But that's just a, a little um, family tree of how this happened and so Judah has made an alliance with the house of Ahab and as a result of that things have gone very bad and so it's not a good thing to be related to royalty in these times because if you're related to royalty and the opposite power gets in you're in trouble you might as well run for your life because you're going to be skewered. You're going to be um, terminated because you're deemed as a threat to the throne. And so Jehoram, he married a daughter of King Ahab of Israel, Athaliah, whose mother was Jezebel. And he followed the ways of the kings of Israel. He followed the ways of the house of Ahab. Why? Because he had married the daughter of Ahab and so they were a bad group of people which started with Omri way back in, uh, in Israel. In 2 Chronicles 21.11 it says, Jehoram had forsaken the Lord, the God of his ancestors. He also built high places on the hills of Judah and had caused the people of Jerusalem to prostitute themselves and had led Judah astray. He received that letter from Elijah the prophet which said um, the way in which he, he died, okay. Um, he built those, those places to lead the country astray and he died a painful death at age 40. Now, the Bible says he passed away to no one's regret. And he was buried in the city of David, but not in the tombs of the kings. How would you like that on your tombstone? Here lies Jehoram, king of Israel, passed away to no one's regret. In other words, good riddance to bad rubbish. Not a good way to go. And of course, as a result, he died a very painful death of, um, as... The, prophet, the prophecy of Elijah came to pass. So the next king that we look at in this um, passage of scripture is Ahaziah. Okay, so in uh, 22, 2 to 4, um, Ahaziah, and it says, he too followed the ways of the house of Ahab, for his mother encouraged him to act wickedly, he did evil in the eyes of the Lord as the house of Ahab had done for after his father's death they became his advisors to his undoing. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord because he'd married into Ahab's family. He was 22 years old when he became king and he reigned in Jerusalem one year. His mother's name, of course, was Athaliah. And um, in Chronicles, it tells us that uh, she was a granddaughter of Omri. And we know that uh, her name the, uh, was Jezebel. If you're a mum here today, imagine having these uh, comments written for his mother encouraged him to act wickedly he did evil in the eyes of the Lord as the house of Ahab had done for after his father's death they became his advisors to his undoing so the house of Ahab was the advisors uh, to Ahaziah and then How did he die? <clears throat> he died 
<clears throat> because he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Young people, older people, don't be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Or difficult times will happen. And that's exactly what happens to Azariah. So, Joram, not Jehoram, Joram, G-O-R-A-M, he's, um, he's the king of Israel. He does a deal with Jehoram, we're going to go and fight Haziel um, from the Ar Arameans. And so they go off and have a big blue. Jehoram gets badly injured. So as a result of that, he um, goes down to Jezreel, um, Joram does, uh, to recuperate, to get better. And so um, Ahaziah decides, well, hey, this fellow's my, this is my cousin, this bloke, you know, so to kind of recall the, the little family tree there. He's my cousin. I'm going to go and visit him. You know, seeing we've got a bit of an alliance, we're buddies, we fight together, we do stuff together. I'm going to go and visit him and see how he's going. So he gets in his chariot, goes up from Judah again to Jezreel to see him. Now, in the meantime, in the meantime, the prophet Elisha sends a, a letter, okay, via one of the young prophets to Jehu. Jehu, the son of Nimshi. And this little letter says, well, we're, and with a flask of oil, this young prophet anointed Jehu, king of Israel, and told him that your mission is to destroy the house of Ahab and all its descendants. And so Jehu gets in his chariot and he goes looking for the king of Israel, which is Jehoram, or sorry, Joram. And he finds him at Jezreel. And of course, who's there at the same time? Ahaziah. And so Joram has recovered sufficiently, so um, Jehu's coming with his little band of men and uh, in his chariot. And so Joram and Ahaziah get in their chariots, one chariot each, and they're going, out, they're going to go out there and see this bloke because they know it's Jehu because the scripture says, okay, we know it's Jehu because he drives like a maniac. He's a high-speed chariot driver, this fellow. I can just imagine it. You know, you've probably seen pictures of, you know, Ben-Hur movies and stuff like that with chariots out sideways. I can imagine Jehu driving his chariot like that. So he was a man of action. I kind of like that little bit about him, but <laughs> that's about it, you know. <laughs> but um, anyhow, so these two fellows go out to meet him, but in the... Previously, they'd sent out a couple of horsemen to, um, to see whether he was coming in peace and none of those fellows returned. They were told, don't you, don't you go back there, you just join our crew and you'll be okay. So they joined that crew. But anyhow, when Jehoram got out there, he said to Jehu, do you come in peace? And he says, what peace is there for those that are associated with um, Ahab and Jezebel? Whoa, so immediately he knows that there's treason afoot. So the scripture says that he wheels his chariot about, right, to a try and escape, but Jehu, okay, skewered him with an arrow, pierced his heart, and he was dead. That's Joram. Ahaziah, our man, he's trying to escape, <clears throat> and he also got, um, got damaged in his escape, Okay, and the Bible says that he also died in Megiddo, I think it is. So that's where he was trying to escape to. And if you look in chapter 22 of Chronicles, <coughs> and verse 7, and it says, Through Ahaziah's visit to Joram, God brought about uh, Ahaziah's downfall. When Ahaziah arrived, he went out with Joram to meet Jehu, son of Nimshi, whom the Lord had anointed to destroy the house of Ahab. And while Jehu was executing judgment on the house of Ahab, he found officials of Judah and sons of Ahaziah's relatives 
who had been attending Ahaziah, and he killed them. He then went in search of Ahaziah, and his men captured him. While he was hiding in Samaria, he was brought to Jehu and put to death. They buried him, for they said he was a son of Jehoshaphat, who thought, who sought the Lord with all his heart, so there was no one in the house of Ahaziah powerful enough to retain the kingdom. If you read the story in Kings also, you get a little bit more and different information. So, um, so that's how Ahaziah uh, passed away. He died because he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. If he had been down in Judah, possibly. If he had stayed home, he would have been okay. But he was buried out of respect for his grandfather, Jehoshaphat. So his servants actually took him back to Jerusalem and buried him there in the tombs of the kings in Jerusalem. Athaliah, <coughs> a little reminder from where, where she fits in. Okay, so Ahab and Jezebel um, are up there, are king, the king and queen of Israel, and then Athaliah is the daughter. She marries Jehoram. Ahaziah is the son. Now, Ahaziah is dead, right? He's just been killed. So what's going to happen now? We're in trouble. We've got no one strong enough, it says, or powerful enough to retain the kingdom. Now, Athaliah, she's a piece of work. In 2 Chronicles 22 and verse 10, it says, When Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, she proceeded to destroy the whole royal family of the house of Judah. She just proceeded to destroy anyone that uh, was of royal lineage of um, the house of Judah. There's a little note there, though, or in verse 11, somebody else will be talking about this, but Jehosheba, the daughter of King Joram, right? Now, daughter of uh, King Joram, Jor sorry, Joram, but not, um, not um, uh, what, what I want to say is that Athaliah is not her mother. Okay, so she's the, da the daughter of King Joram, but um, Athaliah is not a mother, so from another mother. And, um, <coughs> but anyhow... Uh, Athaliah is trying to kill the whole royal family, but um, Jisha Sheba, she took Joash, um, one of his little little sons or little boys, stole him away from among the royal princes who were about to be murdered and put him and his nurse in a bedroom and, uh, and protected him because Jisha Sheba, the daughter of King Joram and wife of the priest Jehoiada, was Ahaziah's sister. She, she, she hid the child from Athaliah so she, so she could not kill him. He remained hidden with them at the temple of God for six years while Athaliah ruled the land. So um, the little bloke was in hiding with, um, with a nurse to look after him and um, praise the Lord, he, uh, he survived. Not that um, he became a good king or anything like that but um, he survived anyhow Athaliah she assumed the throne she just assumed it she wasn't appointed she just assumed it because um, of who she was and had opportunity to do so and because there was no one powerful enough to retain the kingdom Right, so there are some things that we need to remember about, uh, about this story. Um, there are things that we need to remind ourselves as we move on in our lives. And you kind of think, well, you know, what's all this about? Does this happen today? I mean, these people's lives are full of treachery, of bloodshed, 
of destruction, of wondering whether you're going to see the day out. Does it happen today? Yes, it does. Is it happening now? Yes, it is. Imagine what's happening in Ukraine, for example. I oh, know those, those tanks and that big lineup on the border, they're not coming to fight us, okay? It's a military exercise. We're not going to war. No, no, we're not coming to invade. We're not doing anything like that. We're, this is just a military exercise and we're just accumulating um, military hardware on the other side of the border. And there, that's the, the whole rhetoric. And they're still at, not at war. I know it's a military exercise. Treachery. Deception. In Myanmar, it's a military coup. That is full on deception and treachery and capturing the... Um, you know, the Prime Minister of Myanmar or whoever and putting them in jail and then military taking over because they just want to be more powerful and they think they can do it. It's happening all around us. Does it happen in Australia? Yes, it does. Every day you turn on your TV, it talks about most days someone has been murdered, okay, someone has been hijacked, Okay, someone has been deceived and out at uh, Laidley just the other day, you know, that they, four people, okay, they um, stabbed a fella to death in his front yard at night in the undercover of darkness. Okay, so devised a plan, we're going to get this bloke. It's happening. It happens everywhere. And so... What about you and I? Firstly, you and I need to follow the Lord in the way that he has prescribed in his word for you and I to live. We need to follow him in that way. Now, I think Kev read to us last week, Micah 6 and 8. He has shown you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? And that's what we need to do. We need to act in ways that honor and bring glory to the Lord. There are so many verses in the Bible that um, remind us of how we should live. And... Um, one of these little passages in, is in Colossians 1, 9 to 14. And, and this is a prayer for the Colossians that Paul has written down. And he says, For this reason, since the day we heard of, about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives. Now, here we go in verse 10. So that you may live a life worthy of the Lord. Please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience. Give thanks, give joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he's rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. What a wonderful thing to be able to live for the Lord. And that's how he wants you and I to live. Of course, through life, you and I are going to face many trials, many temptations. It doesn't mean that if you follow the Lord... Life is going to be a cruise. It doesn't mean that if you follow the Lord, there's no illness or trouble or hardship in your family. No, no, they're just the normal things of life. And James reminds us in verse 
<coughs> chapter 1 and verse 2 to 4, he says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let per perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So live <coughs> in a way that the Lord has prescribed in his word. That's first. Right. Secondly, who is giving you advice? Are you getting it from the house of Ahab? We all need advice. Where do you get yours from? You want financial advice. Who do you get your financial advice from? Somebody who's going to be a little bit down the middle and, you know, be careful with your resources. Somebody who's going to put you in debt to the nth degree that you'll never be able to pay. Who do you get your advice from? You need to be very careful of who you get your advice from. For advice for life, advice for living. You need to have a, a go-to person. And that person initially is the Lord Jesus himself. You need to... Um, get your advice from those people, okay, that bring honor and glory to the Lord. It says about Ahaziah, remember, after his father's death, the house of Ahab became his advisors to his undoing. So the advice that you get can be something really good or it can be to your undoing. Remember that. Be careful who you marry. Hey, that's good advice. Be careful who you marry. Young people, marry a believer, someone who's on the same page, a person who believes and trusts in the Lord, someone who's committed their lives to him for forgiveness of sin and a home in heaven. Someone who is following the Lord Jesus with his or her whole life. That's who you need to marry. Jehoram married Athaliah from the house of Ahab. What a mess that created. What a mess. And so because he's connected to those people, he decides to act in a certain way which brought about the death and destruction of a lot of people. What an important decision that is. The Bible tells us in um, 2 Corinthians 6, 14 to 16, do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? Black and white. What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. You and I are temples of the living God. The Lord Jesus himself lives inside you by his spirit. His Holy Spirit lives inside of your body which is his house. And he has determined that he wants to, in most cases, bring about his plan through you and I as we live for him. Lastly, mothers and fathers, they influence their children. Bible tells us to train up a child in the way that he would go and when he is old he will not depart from it. Well, we all know that some children are prodigals. 
but um, you and I have a responsibility to teach and train our children in the ways of the Lord. It's not the school's responsibility. It's not the church's responsibility. It's yours. We take our kids to school to learn. We take our kids to church to to learn about God. But it's my responsibility. It's your responsibility. Once a father, always a father. Once a mother, always a mother. That doesn't mean necessarily we're responsible for for our kids when they become of age and and set sail and do their own life. But you're going to be giving advice to that person possibly to the day that you, you die. And your life is a testimony before your children right throughout life. You have tremendous influence on your family. May you use that influence for the glory of God. Athaliah, it says, she turned <coughs> turned the heart of her son Ahaziah away from God, encouraged him to follow idols, encouraged him to worship idols, encouraged him in wickedness, it says. What mother or father encourages their children in wickedness? You and I have a responsibility to honour the Lord (coughs) in the way that we influence our children. And may you be on your knees daily for your family, for his glory. We'll pause now, we'll pray and just ask the Lord for his blessing. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to to look at your word. Help us to learn from it, I pray. I pray that you would encourage us each to be men and women of God. The example of these people that we've looked looked at today is just totally the opposite. Men and women of the devil. Lord Jesus, I pray that your spirit would live in us and fire us in a way that would enable us to to honour you in the way that we talk to people, in the way that we live our life, in the way that we influence our families. For your glory, I pray. In the name of Jesus, amen.